Welcome back to the RSET training, Agricultural Crop Classifications with Synthetic Aperture Radar and Optical Remote Sensing. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm a scientific analyst at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and a trainer with the RSET program. We learned from Dr. Laura Dingle Robertson on how Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada has implemented an Earth observation-based operational crop inventory at the national level using synthetic aperture radar, optical data, and open source software. Laura also walked us through SAR imagery pre-processing using SNAP software. In the fourth part of this webinar series, we'll learn from Teresa Roth how one uses machine learning algorithms for crop classification. Teresa is a remote sensing specialist at Circo and Copernicus's research and user support. Following the theoretical portion of her presentation, Teresa will demonstrate how to use Python packages in Jupyter Lab to run supervised and unsupervised classification for crop classifications. If participants wish to follow along with Teresa's demonstration, you will need Anaconda and Jupyter Lab installed on your machine. Additionally, you will need to have access to the pre-processed data created in part three of the training. Following Teresa's demonstration, we'll hear again from Dr. Laura Dingle Robertson, a physical scientist at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, on how Canada performs post-processing steps on classified images and publishes uh, them in their annual crop inventory on Open Canada. As a reminder, there will be one homework assignment posted to the training page on the last week of the webinar series. Answers must be submitted by Google Form by the due date of November 2nd. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline of November 2nd. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marina Spartin. I will now pass it over to Teresa Roth from Copernicus's research and user support to, to discuss more on machine learning for crop classification. Teresa, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction and welcome to all the participants also from my side. Let's start with a quick overview of today's session. We will first review some theory basics on supervised and unsupervised machine learning algorithms and their use in crop classification. Then we will look at some of the algorithms in more detail, and these will be the random forest, the support vector machine, and the k-means. Then we will move to the demonstration part of this session, where I will first introduce some selected machine learning libraries, and then I will tell you about the satellite and training and validation data we will use today. Finally, we will move on to the practical demonstration of crop classification using radar and optical data in Python and Jupyter Notebook. After the demo, we will have a question and answer session where I will try to answer any questions that you may have about the topics discussed. So let's start. First, let me briefly recap what is machine learning. Machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence, or AI, and computer science, which focuses on the use of data and algorithms to imitate the way that humans learn. There are two basic approaches, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. The main difference between them is that one uses labeled or training data to help predict the outcomes, while the other does not. Supervised learning can be separated into two types of problems, classification and regression. Classification problems use an algorithm to accurately assign test data into specific categories, for example, separating apples and oranges. Or as we will see today, differentiating between crops in satellite imagery. The most common types of classification algorithms are, for example, linear classifiers, decision trees, random forest, or support vector machines. We will talk about the last two more in detail, and we will also use them in our demonstration. Another type of supervised learning problem is regression that uses algorithm to understand the, the relationship between dependent and independent variables. 
Some popular regression algorithms are linear regression, logistic regression, and polynomial regression. But also the algorithms already mentioned for classification can be used for regression. We will, however, not discuss regression further today. Compared to supervised algorithms, the unsupervised learning uses machine learning algorithms to analyze and cluster unlabeled data sets because we don't have any training data. These algorithms discover hidden patterns in the data without the need for human intervention. Unsupervised learning models are used for three main tasks, and these are clustering, association, and dimensionality reduction. I will only mention the first one, which is clustering, and specifically, I will mention one of the algorithms most commonly used for clustering, which is called k-means. So now let's talk about the use of machine learning for crop classification in more detail. Machine learning is widely used for crop classification with very good results. Two of the most popular algorithms are Random Forest and SVM, due to their simple implementation and robust performance. As mentioned before, these are both in the category of supervised classification algorithms. This means that they use training data to learn the relationships in our datasets and correctly classify the pixels into crop classes. A rigorous quality control of this reference data set is very important for the accuracy of the model we create, because any errors in the reference data set will decrease the accuracy of our model. While the machine learning algorithms perform very well, the transferability of the model is very limited between study sites or, for example, even growth periods. There is a significant research effort going into developing a model or a training phase, which would allow the model to be trained in one location or a country and then used to classify a different study area. But at the moment, retraining is generally always necessary for different study sites or different growth periods or years. At the end of the day, the random forest usually performs best, but the SVM can also give very good results for datasets with small number of classes and well-balanced share of samples between classes. When we look at the validation and accuracy assessment of our results, it is very important to follow strict rules and best practices. At the bottom of the slide, you can find references to some papers that provide a good overview. Don't worry if the text is too small now. You will be able to download the presentation and access all the links later. I will not go into depth on this topic, as it would be for another very long presentation. However, some points to keep in mind are that accuracy assessment should always be statistically rigorous, transparent, reproducible, and provide similar results if repeated on the same dataset. The validation dataset we use should always be independent from the training dataset and rigorously quality controlled as any errors and biases in the validation data set will lead to degradation and inaccuracies in our accuracy assessment. One thing to keep in mind is that the overall accuracy value can often be misleading since one class can have high accuracy and many validation samples, therefore skewing the overall accuracy value even if accuracy of other classes is very low. We should use metrics like F-score, which can give us better overview of accuracy of each class. So let's now talk about the algorithms specifically. We will start with the random forest. Random forest is a one of the most well-known and used supervised machine learning algorithms. Like its name implies, random forest consists of a large number of individual decision trees that operate as an ensemble. Therefore, we call it an ensemble classifier. Each individual tree in the random forest spits out a class prediction, and the class with the most votes becomes our model's prediction. Decision trees are very sensitive to the data they are trained on. 
This means that even small changes to the training data set can result in significantly different tree structures. Random Forest takes advantage of this by allowing each individual tree to randomly sample from the input data set with replacement, resulting in different trees working with slightly different inputs. This process is known as bagging and makes the model more robust by creating less correlated trees, which protect each other from individual errors. Another advantage of bagging is the possibility to calculate the out-of-bag score, which can be used to get an idea about the performance of the model already during the training phase. So what do we mean when we say out-of-bag? During the bagging, some of the training data rows are always left out of the sample given to a particular tree. The performance of a given tree can be then checked by feeding it these rows that were not included in its original training sample. This is done for all the trees, and then the out-of-bag or OOB score is computed as the number of correctly predicted rows from the out-of-bag sample. The OPB, however, does not replace the need for validation with independent data set, as the OBB is calculated only using predictions by a subset of trees and not the entire model. Now let's have a look at some parameters that we can use to influence our random forest model. Since, as I have mentioned, the random forest algorithm is an ensemble modeling technique, it increases the generalization by creating a number of different kinds of trees with different depths and sizes. The n estimators is the number of trees you want the algorithm to create. Generally, larger number of trees will result in higher accuracy, but it will also increase the computational cost. In the image, you can see that the increase in accuracy is not linear, and at some point, the improvement in accuracy will become negligible. The optimal number of trees will then depend on the other parameters, but also on the size of the training data set and the number of features. For Earth observation data classification purposes, the number of 500 trees is often quoted in literature, although studies exist that use also 70, 100, 1,000 or 5,000 trees. In Python, the optimal number of trees can be tested by using the out-of-bag error estimate, or OOB, when the random forests are trained on the same data set with increasing number of estimators and the OOB for each model is plotted. The disadvantage of this is that for large training data sets, this can be very time demanding and computationally heavy. The next parameter is the criterion, or in other words, the measure used to determine where or on what feature the tree has to be split at a tree node. There are two main methods for this, and these are the calculation of the Gini impurity index or the entropy. For example, suppose that we are looking at classifying fruits and there are two parameters, shape and color, based on which the splitting of the tree has to be done. The algorithm does the split using both features and then chooses the one which results in lower entropy or a lower Gini impurity after the split. The Gini index has values inside the interval of 0 to 0 0.5, whereas the interval for the entropy is 0 to 1. While they are calculated differently, there is very little factual difference or very little impact on the results of the random forest. Generally, the Gini index is used as a default setting since the entropy is more computationally complex and results in longer computation times. Usually, again to decrease the computational cost, not all features are tested at each node. Instead, at every split, the algorithm chooses some features randomly and the max features parameter determines how many features need to be selected for determining the split. The default in scikit-learn library is value auto, which sets the max features to the square root 
of the total number of available features. Another parameter is the maximum tree depth, which is the measure of how much further the tree has to be expanded down to each node until we get to the leaf node or the final node. Generally, in a tree-based algorithm, the deeper the tree, the more the chance that it overfits the data. Since Random Forest ensembles several different trees together, it is generally accepted to have deep trees as overfitting is unlikely. Apart from the maximum tree depth, another way to control the depth of a tree is to specify the minimum number of elements or records that has to be present at each node to determine if the algorithm can stop splitting further. For example, if we set the min sample split to be 3, after the first split of the tree in the image, there is only 3 records on the left node, and even though the node is not pure, it will not be split any further. The final two parameters that I will discuss are the bootstrap and the sample size. I have already mentioned the bagging or bootstrapping, which is a synonym, and its advantages. It is also possible to run the random forest without the bagging or bootstrapping, but if we do, we will lose the main advantage of random forest and possibly create a model that is not robust. When we are talking about bagging, it seems that we are selecting a subset of the training data. However, this is not necessarily always true. We can choose a sample size of n, which can be equal or smaller or even larger than the training data set size. And then we randomly select this number of samples or any number of samples from our training data set. However, every time we sample a value, we return or we can say keep it in the training data as well. This means that some values can be selected multiple times not only in the samples for different trees, but also in the same sample. Generally, using the same sample size as the training dataset size have been shown to improve accuracy. However, for very large datasets, it is also more computationally demanding. Depending on the implementation or package that you're using, there may be more parameters that you can optimize or not all the parameters named here may be available. Now we discussed what random forest is and how it works and what are the parameters we can optimize. Let's then run through a quick non-technical example in which we want to teach the algorithm to recognize two types of fruits, bananas and oranges. In real life, this would of course be very easy and could be done with a single attribute or feature, for example, color or shape. Let's imagine though that there are oranges that can be yellow and bananas that can be round and thus creating a bit more confusion between the classes. At the top of the slide are some parameters that we have set in our model. We start with the first tree and randomly sample our training data set with replacement since the bootstrap parameter is enabled and we will select the same number of samples as in our original data because the max samples is set to none which means that the same size as the original training data set should be selected. Then we randomly select three out of our four features since the max feature parameter is set to three and this can be for example color, taste, and size. Then we test all three of the features and select the one giving us the best separation, meaning lowest Gini index or entropy. In this case, it is the taste, and we split the sample based on whether they are sweet or sour. Now on one side is already a clean split that contains only sour oranges, However, on the other side, we still have a mixed sample. We repeat the process on the mixed sample, and this time the best separator is 
select it as shape. And we have now reached a pure separation in all of our leaf or final nodes. Because our model contains five trees, we repeat the process from the random sample selection, again for each of the remaining trees, until our model is trained. We can now estimate the out-of-back score to see how our model performed during the training. And finally, we can also feed it a new observation for which we need to know the class or we can test it with an independent validation dataset. Next, we will talk about the support vector machine algorithm. A support vector machine, or SVM, is a discriminative classifier used for classification, regression, and detection of outliers. Its objective is to find a hyperplane in an n-dimensional space where n represents the number of features in our training dataset. We want to find a hyperplane such that it distinctly divides our dataset points based on their class. In two-dimensional space, this hyperplane is a line, so 2D line, dividing a plane in two parts where each class lays on either side. In three-dimensional space, it is a plane However, in reality, datasets will usually have many more features than three. And while we cannot draw, draw such a plane, it can be solved mathematically. OK, so far so good. But how do we choose this hyperplane? Now you can see that to separate two classes of data points, there are many possible hyperplanes that could be chosen. Our objective is to find a plane that has the maximum margin, i.e. the maximum distance between data points of both classes. Maximizing the margin distance provides some reinforcement so that future data points can be classified with more confidence. To maximize the margin distance, we use the points close to the hyperplane, and we call them the support vectors, thus the support vector machine. Now consider what if we had data as shown here in the image. Clearly, there is no straight line that we can draw to separate the two classes. So what can we do? We can select point Z, apply a transformation, and add one more dimension we can call Z axis. Next, we can plot the points along the Z axis based on their distance from point Z or Z origin. Now we can draw a line that clearly separates the data. When we transform this line back to the original plane, it maps to circular boundary. These transformations are called kernels or kernel functions. Most SVM implementations provide them already in build and their function is to take the input data and transform it into the required form, so a hyperplane separating the classes can be fitted. Different SVM algorithms use different types of kernel functions, and between the functions usually available for a kernel parameter are linear, nonlinear, polynomial, radial basis function, and sigmoid. Usually the RBF, or radial basis function, is set as default. If the kernel is set to polynomial, radial basis function, or sigmoid, we can further control the influence of each point on the position of the hyperplane by tuning parameter called gamma. The gamma parameter defines how far the influence of a single training example reaches, with low values meaning far and high values meaning close. In, in other words, with low gamma, points far away from the plausible separation line are considered in the calculation for the separation line, whereas high gamma means only the points close to the plausible line are considered in the calculation. As mentioned in the beginning, the algorithm is always trying to achieve the largest margin possible 
as this creates more robust separation between the classes. However, if it is not regulated, it can come at a great computational cost and result in overfitted algorithm, which will perform perfectly on the training data set, but not on other data sets, such as the validation data set. To control this, we have available the regularization parameter given as C in the Python's scikit-learn library. The regularization value tells the SVM optimization how much we want to avoid misclassifying each training example. It functions as a penalty for each misclassified point weighed by the distance to the hyperplane. If the penalty is large, meaning high values of C, the optimization will choose a smaller margin hyperplane if that hyperplane does a better job of getting all the training points classified correctly. Conversely, a very small penalty will cause the optimizer to look for larger margin separating hyperplane, even if that hyperplane misclassifies some points. The final algorithm we will look at today is unsupervised clustering algorithm called k-means. k-means is an iterative unsupervised algorithm that tries to partition the data set into k predefined distinct non-overlapping clusters where each data point belongs only to one group or cluster. It tries to make the intra-cluster data points as similar as possible, while also keeping the clusters as different or as far from one another as possible. It assigns data points to a cluster by trying to minimize the sum of the squared distance between the data points and the centroid of that cluster. The less variation we have within clusters, the more homogeneous or similar the data points within the cluster are. In the animation, we can see the iterations of the algorithm trying to assign points to three classes. First, the centroids are selected randomly, and you can see the centroid of each cluster in the animation, although unfortunately it has the same color as the points, so it is not very well visible. You can see that at every iteration, the boundaries are redrawn and the centroid is moved. As the iteration number increases, the moves are smaller and smaller until there is no change in the position of the centroid and the assignment of the points to the cluster is no longer changing. Since clustering algorithms, including k-means, use distance-based methods to determine the similarity between data points, it is recommended to standardize the data to have a mean of zero and standard deviation of one, since almost always the features in any data set would have different units of measurement, such as, for example, age versus income. Now let's look at the parameters of the k-means algorithm. Firstly, we need to provide the algorithm with the number of clusters that we expect in our data set. Standard literature suggests we use the elbow method to determine how many clusters we need. However, there are more than 30 indices and methods for identifying the optimal number of clusters, and in reality, this is only an additional guess. Now, k-means is notoriously dependent on the centroid initialization. Due to the fact that it randomly assigns initial cluster centroids, and then tries to group as many points as possible based on the points distance to the centroid, it can get stuck in a local minimum. This in turn means we will not get the best result. We can mitigate this if we know the approximate position of the centroids. We can set them using the init parameter and improve the starting point. If we don't provide the initial centroids or we don't know them, we can use the next parameter, which is number of initial centroid selections. If set to 10, for example, the algorithm will initialize the centroids 10 times and will pick the most converging value as the best fit for the starting iteration. 
The last parameter that I will mention is the random state. This is setting the random seed, and it is useful if we want to reproduce the exact same clusters over and over again. We can set it to any number we want, and just remember it when we want to reproduce the run. OK, so that was a lot of theoretical information, but I hope that now you have a good overview of how each of these algorithms work. Let's then finally move to the demonstration part. Before we move to the Jupyter Notebook, I will say a few words about the tools and satellite and training data that we will use. Here, you can see listed selected libraries used for machine learning in Python. The best well-known and also widely used is probably scikit-learn, which we will also use today. It includes an easy integration with different machine learning programming libraries, such as NumPy or Pandas, and comes with the support of various algorithms such as classification, regression, clustering, dimensionality reduction, model selection, and data preprocessing. Then we have the TensorFlow, which is also a very popular library offered by Google, with advanced functionality such as deep learning and neural networks. Finally, I named the Keras library, which builds on top of TensorFlow and extends it with additional features for machine learning and deep learning programming. Now, this list is by no means exhaustive, and you can find many more libraries used in Python for machine learning. Now, let's say a few words about our starting point for the demonstration. I will start with already pre-processed Sentinel-1 images, as you have covered the pre-processing in the previous session. For Sentinel-2, I will show you the pre-processing in SNAP before starting the Jupyter Notebook demo. All the images have been acquired during the growing season between 1st of September 2018 and 1st of June 2019 over our study area in central Argentina. In total, our input stack contains 22 Sentinel-1 images and 10 Sentinel-2 images. We have selected only cloud-free Sentinel-2 level 1 top of atmosphere reflectance images. As for our study period, the level 2 atmospherically corrected images were not yet available on operational basis. To further limit the size of the final data set, I have included only visible bands, meaning band two, three, and four, the near-infrared band eight, and the two shortwave infrared bands 11 and 12. The final stack contains 104 co-registered bands, 60 for the Sentinel-2, and 44 for Sentinel-1. Below, you can see the timeline of our images with Sentinel-1 in red and Sentinel-2 in green. Now, the training and validation data that we will use for the demonstration are derived from the high-resolution cropland and crop type map of Argentina. This map was produced by using random forest classification, combining several seasonal indices from the whole year, the summer and the winter, with indices that describe temporal dynamics of the vegetation. The country was divided into 14 agricultural zones, and the classification of each zone was performed separately. You can find more information about this data set in the paper reference at the bottom of the slide. Our study area lies in zone 10, which contains seven crop classes and a mast class, which combines water bodies, wetlands, and urban areas. This study area, or agricultural area, showed overall accuracy of 90%. The original raster data of the crop map were kindly vectorized and prepared by Laura Dingle Robertson from the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. The preparation steps consisted of vectorization, removal of very small polygons, smaller than five hectares, and removal of very large polygons. Then the overall number of polygons for the major classes was further reduced. And finally, the data set was split 70-30 to training and validation data. 
Usually, these polygons would be used for the training of the classifiers. Unfortunately, the number of pixels in these polygons was still too large for the purpose of this demonstration and would require too long training and training data extraction. In such cases, we have two available options. Either we can further reduce the number of polygons or we can randomly select specific number of points per class within our polygons. I have chosen the latter approach and extracted 1000 random points per class in our training dataset and 200 points per class for the validation dataset with the minimum distance of 10 meters between the points. All the preparation was done using QGIS. I will not show the preparation of this dataset today, but I will provide you with a file detailing each step. So let's now finally move to the Jupyter Lab for the processing. And here we go. I will be using a machine which is Linux based. However, any steps that I will show you today can be easily transferred to Windows or Mac. The only difference will be in the paths used for the preparation or creation of the Anaconda environment in which we will run our Jupyter notebook. First, let me show you the input data sets. I have the folder already opened here and my input data have already been downloaded from the Copernicus Open Access Hub. I have placed them into two folders. I have the Sentinel-1 input data, which contains 22 Sentinel-1 images, and I have the Sentinel-2 input data. This folder contains 10 Sentinel-2 Level 1C images. Now, I will not go into the preprocessing and co-registration of the Sentinel-1 images, as you have covered this in part three of this webinar series, but I will show you how to pre-process the Sentinel-2 images and how to co-register or collocate the Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 datasets to create the combined input dataset that we will use today in our Python notebook. To do this, we will use Snap. So let me just open it. And let's first open one of our Sentinel-2 images. In SNAP, we can easily see the structure of our product and we can also see all the available bands. And we can, for example, create an RGB composite. Here I will create a simply a natural color RGB composite using bands 4, 3 and 2. And here we go. Sentinel-2 tiles are always of the size of 100 by 100 kilometers. And the data are already resampled to a common grid. So for any time series that you create from Sentinel-2 data, you can be sure that the pixels will be corresponding to each other. Now, this whole tile would be way too large for us to process in Python, especially because we are using very, very large stack of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data. So of course, we want to reduce the size, both the number of bands and also in spatial extent. We can, of course, run all the operators one by one in the graphic, graphic window, or we can use the functionality of SNAP, which is called Graph Builder, create a graph and then apply it in batch processing to all our 10 images. So let me create the graph that we will use for pre-processing our Sentinel-2 images. Let's go to Tools and Graph Builder. And here you can see that we only have two operators now. To add an operator, you can simply right click and then search for the operator that you wish. The two operators that we will add will be resample and subset. Now we need to resample our data for the simple reason that not all the bands in Sentinel-2 are of the same pixel size. We have the 10 meter bands, which are the visible bands and the near infrared band 8. Then we have the 20 meter bands, which are the red edge bands and the short wave infrared bands. And then we have the 60 meter bands, which we call atmospheric bands, which are, for example, band 1, band 9 and band 10. In our further processing, we will want to use the visible bands, meaning the bands 2, 3 and 4, the wide 
near infrared band, which is called band 8, and the shortwave infrared bands 11 and 12. You can see that these bands, of course, have different pixel resolution. We have 10 and 20 meters in our subset data set later, so we need to resample them first. So let's go to Add and Raster and Geometric and Resample. And we can simply connect it to the read operator by dragging the arrow from the read operator to Resample. Now we also want to subset our data, as I've mentioned already. And we can again add it by going to Raster, Geometric and Subset and again connect them together. At this point, we can either set our parameters here in the tabs below and simply run the graph for this one product that we have entered or that we have loaded into SNAP. Or we can save this graph and use it in the batch processing. And then we can also edit the parameters later in the batch processing. So let me save it, simply calling it S2 processing. And now I will just close the graph and I will go back to tools and open the batch processing menu. Here we can load all the products that we wish to process. So let me load them first by going to add and then navigating to the Sentinel-2 folder where I have the zipped Sentinel-2 files. I select all of them and click OK. They will be loaded here into the menu. And we also have some attributes for each of them. For example, the date of acquisition. Then I can load a graph that I have just created. So S2 processing. And you can now see that there is additional tabs appearing here next to the input output parameters tab. These correspond to the operators that we have included in our graph. One more thing that I will change here in the input output parameters tab is to deselect the keep source product name. Now the keep source product name will cause that our output will have the same name as the input. This can be okay. However, in some cases it can cause confusion and therefore I will just deselect it, which will cause the operator to simply add a suffix or a prefix for every operator which we have applied to the name of our input data. Then we will go one by one between the tabs and set our parameters. So the first tab is the resample tab. Now here we have three options. We can resample our data by a reference band from the source product or by target width and height in pixels or by pixel resolution. So for example, if our desired pixel resolution is 100 meters, we don't have to calculate how many pixels in width and height this would be, but we can simply set it here. On the other hand, if we want the same resolution as another band that is already present in our product, we can simply use the option one, which we will use here, and select the specific band we want to use. In this case, I will use one of the visible bands, which for example, can be the band two or the blue band, which have 10 meter resolution. The next step is the subset. In subset, we have again two options. We can subset our product based on the bands that it will include, and we can also subset it spatially. For the spatial subset, we have an option to use the pixel coordinates or geographic coordinates. Pixel coordinates may appear simpler, but if you're using time series or doing any kind of batch processing, I would always recommend the geographic coordinates as the pixel coordinates between different images can be slightly different and it will then cause shifts in your data. First though, let's select the bands that we wish to use. So I've already mentioned that we will be using the visible bands, so two, three, and four, the wide near infrared band, band eight, and the shortwave infrared bands, 11 and 12. We will also use the geographic coordinates so of course, especially if you are using the data in further processing, you may want to have a specific study area that you're looking at. And that can be easily entered here below in a well-known text format in a VGS lat projection. 
If you do not have such a polygon, you can also select the area manually, simply by zooming in. And we can see this is the outline of our or footprint of our input product. And I can simply draw a polygon over my perceived study area. If I now change between tabs, you will see that all of a sudden this field here is populated and it is populated with the polygon corresponding to this little polygon here. Then I can finally go to the right tab and here I can set the directory into which I want to save our data and I can also set the format. Now you can choose from many different formats but I would always suggest working with the beam dim format, which is the default snap format, as long as you plan to stay in snap and only convert, for example, to GeoTIFF once you're uh, planning to go out of snap into a different software or, for example, to Python. There is also the option to change the name. However, I do not recommend it as this name here corresponds only to the first data set in our input output parameters. So the name that you change here will only be applied to the first data set and all the others will default back to the same format as shown here. So now if I wanted to process all our 10 products, I can simply click run and wait for the processing to complete. This does not take very long because we are using very few operators and they are very simple. However, I will not run the processing now since I already have the data processed. So let me now close the window and open one of the processed images. The beam dim up format always consists of two different files. One is a folder and then we have the header file, which is called .dim. And this is the one that we always want to load into Snap. And here we go. We can have a look at the structure. And if we go to bands, you can see that now we have only six bands present here. And these are the bands that we wish to use in our further processing. We can also create an RGB composite. And here we can see our spatial subset. Finally, before we move on to Python, we want to also collocate all our processed Sentinel-2 images and all our pre-processed Sentinel-1 images. In this case, we already have the Sentinel-1 co-registered stack prepared. And if you have followed the part three of this series, you remember that we have there used the co-registration tool. Now, the co-registration tool, unfortunately, does not work well with Sentinel-2 products, and therefore, we have to use a different tool. This tool is called collocation, and it's less accurate. However, if our Sentinel-1 products have been terrain corrected and projected into a map projection, it should still give us high enough accuracy in the collocation. To do this, we will simply go to raster, geometric operations, and collocation. Here we will choose the master and the slave products. So the master here will be the first pre-processed Sentinel-2 product. We have loaded it already into Snap. And the slaves will be the other Sentinel-2 pre-processed products and the Sentinel-1 stack. To load them, we simply go to plus and then add product files. And then I go to Sentinel-2 processing, where I have saved my pre-processed Sentinel-2 data. And I select all except for the first one. Again, I'm selecting the DIM files and click Select Products. Then I will add the Sentinel-1 stack again by Add Product Files. And I have saved the Sentinel-1 stack here in the processing folder. And it's in TIFF format, not in beam DIM map. However, this is not important. We can stack different formats together. That's not an issue. So let's select it. And now you can see that all the products are loaded. And we can choose a name for our stack, which will be S1, S2 stack. And we want to save it as a geotiff. So this will be the input to our processing in Python. 
Beam dim map, as I said, is very good while you are still in Snap, but there is very few softwares or languages or packages for Python, for example, which can read it efficiently. For this reason, we will change it to GeoTiff. And we will leave the home directory as the processing directory. And the final option that we can choose is to rename the master and slave components. Now, the name of the band will always be the same as the original, plus a specific suffix. And for the master, this is just letter M. And for the slave, this is letter S plus the number of the slave. I will leave them as they are by default. I will not run this step now because, again, it's a relatively large data set that we are preparing. Remember, it's 104 bands and it would take relatively long time to write. I have already prepared it up front, so we can directly start with the processing in Python. So let me now close and let me just quickly show you the stack. And here we go. And we can see that it has all our desired bands. So six bands for each of the Sentinel-2 products and two bands for each of the Sentinel-1 products. And now let's move on to the Jupyter Notebook. First, I will close Snap. And this is because the processing that we will be doing in Python is very computationally demanding. You can see that our data set is huge. And Snap also uses quite a lot of memory to run. And it may cause our kernel to crash later. So let me just close Snap. And let's now go to the AUX data folder here, where I have saved the notebook, as well as the instructions on how to install the Conda environment that we will be using today. Now, I will not go into the installation here, but you can find all the information in this install instructions file that will be provided to you after the webinar. Once you create the environment, you can directly run the Jupyter Lab, or if in between creating the environment and running the notebook, you have closed the command line, you can simply reopen it in the folder where your Jupyter notebook is saved or navigate in the command line to that folder. And then we have to activate the environment. To do this, we simply type conda activate env underscore py2. This is the name of the environment. And it is given in the environment file that we have here. Then we can click enter. And you can now see that from base, my environment changed into env py2. To open JupyterLab, which is installed in my environment, I can simply type JupyterLab and press Enter. The JupyterLab will open in a browser, and it will directly open in the folder where I have run it from. We can simply just double click on the Jupyter notebook that we wish to open, and here we go. In the beginning of the notebook, I have included some information, such as, for example, the tutorial for Python, the tutorial for Jupyter Notebook, and the Jupyter Notebook documentation. I will not go through these here now or through the text. You can read it later. And now let's move on to the exercise. So the exercise today is divided to following sections. We will first load the Python packages. Then we will set the different user input data. We will load and visualize our input data. Then we will create the training and validation data sets. Then we will run the supervised classification with random forest, supervised classification with SVM, and unsupervised clustering with k-means. So let's start. To run a cell, you simply select it and then press Control and Enter. Now, some steps that I will show you here in this notebook take quite a long time to process. So do not panic when you're repeating this exercise. Some code cells, depending on the machine that you're running them on, may take up to hour or two hours to run. You can limit this by using a stronger machine or, for example, by limiting the number of images that we include in our original stack. So let's start and let's run our first code cell where we will import our Python packages. I have mentioned some of the machine learning packages in the presentation. 
However, here, of course, we are using many more. We are using the scientific computing package, or NumPy. We are using the matplotlib, which serves for visualization of graphs and images. We are also using the pandas, which serves for data analysis and manipulation. The geopandas, which extends the data types used by pandas to allow spatial operations on geometric types. Then we will also use the snappy, which is a Python interface for snap. Then we will use the EarthPy, which we use to plot and work with spatial raster and vector data using open source tools. And finally, we will also use the Rasterio, which reads and writes raster formats and provides Python API based on NumPy and dimensional arrays and GeoJSON. So let me run the code cell and load all our packages. Next, we will move on to the user input data. So here we want to specify the input data, so the stack that we have just created, as well as the training and validation points. And we will provide these as paths to the data. So our training and validation points are shapefiles, Esri shapefiles. And as I've mentioned in the presentation, the training points consist of 1,000 points per class randomly sampled in the training polygons. And the validation points consist again of a point data file consisting of 200 points per class, again, randomly sampled in our validation data polygons. Finally, I also include a list with the class names of the classes that are present in our study area and in our training and validation data. Since in the training and validation data, they are represented only as number and they do not have specific labels. Okay, so let's run this cell again with control enter and let's move on to creating a custom color map for each of our classes. Now, this is not strictly necessary. You can choose one of the color maps that are available in Matplotlib, but I chose here to have a color map which is very similar to the color map used in the original high resolution crop type map that we have used as our training data set. Here, simply, we create first a dictionary with specific colors assigned to specific crop type. So we have eight classes in our data set. And for each class, I assign a color that consists of RGB values. The last value is transparency, so we don't need to use it. We just simply use 255. Here in comments, you can see which color corresponds to which class. In the next step, we convert our 8-bit values into a float in the range of 0 to 1. So simply, we just divide each of these values by 255. This is simply necessary for matplotlib to understand the values. And in the next step, we simply create a matplotlib color map from the list of colors and call it classification. So let's now run this cell, Control enter and there we go. Every time you run a cell, you will see that here in the brackets, a number will appear, which is the number of order that you have run the cells in. So for example, this cell will be four, this will be five, and once we run the next one, it will be six. Now we will move to the next chapter, which is to load and visualize the input data. We will load the input data into a Rasterio data set. And this is the first cell here. So we have the variable that contains the path to our geotiff stack. And we will simply call rest area open to load it into memory. The next step creates a list of band names. And it is the only step in our notebook that uses the snappy package. And we can again click Control Enter. And the next step finally is the visualization. So let me click into the cell to highlight it. And here we will read all bands of the data set into three dimensional array stack by using the source, which is the name of the loaded Rasterio product, and then read, and we will assign it to variable stack. Here you will see the stack shape, which will be the number of bands and then the row and height of each of them. And then we will use the EarthPy package to visualize the RGB composite of our first Sentinel-2 image and also the RGB composite of our first Sentinel-1 image. For Sentinel-1, this is going to be the combination of polarization VV, VH, and the ratio between VV and VH. 
Now here we simply create a figure which will have two subplots. And in the first subplot, we call the earthpy plot RGB. We assign to the array stack the variable stack where we have loaded our data set. And then we will call the bands 2, 1, and 0. So this corresponds to the first product and to the first three band bands of this product. It is a little bit more complicated for Sentinel-1, since we need to first calculate the ratio of two bands. Now you can also here see that I'm calling bands 60 and 61 here in the stack. And this is because this is the position at which our Sentinel-1 images start. So remember, we have 60 bands of Sentinel-2 in our stack, and then 44 bands of our Sentinel-1. So 60 is the VH band of the first Sentinel-1 product, 61 is the VV band of the first product, and then I want to calculate the ratio. Unfortunately, we cannot feed these just simply one by one to the EarthPy plot, we have to stack them again into an array stack. So that is what I'm creating here. This is array stack. And then I can call the stack stack S1. And I call it here in the RGB plot. And again, assign the bands to the RGB here. So let's again run. And here we go. And here at the top, you can see the shape of the stack that we have now loaded. It has 104 bands. And each band has the width of 2001 values and the height of 2066 values. And if we scroll down, we can now see an RGB composite of our first Sentinel-2 image and RGB composite of our first Sentinel-1 image. In the next section, we will create our training and validation data sets. The first part here is what I like to call a magic code. And it's a piece of code that simply creates a copy of our input raster data set and saves it in a memory file. There should be no reason to run this piece of code in this step, since the same can be achieved or we have done already by the opening of the source image in the rasterio. However, for some reason, this step decreases the time of the run for the next steps of extracting training and validation data sets from approximately two hours without running it to approximately 10 seconds with creating the in-memory copy. I cannot explain this, but perhaps some of you know the reason for this. However, I include this piece of code here as it significantly speeds up our processing. Let me then run this piece and click. Enter. And basically what this does, as I've already mentioned, is reads the bands of the original raster file, which we have opened in the rasterio. Then it copies also the profile, meaning the properties and drivers related to this file. And then it creates a file in memory with the same profile and writes each of the bands of the original file into this new file and then keeps the file open. So let's now move on to the next step, which is the extraction of the training data set using this file or memory file that we have just now created. What do we do here? We first load our training points, so the shape file containing the training points that we have generated. This file contains three attributes in the attribute table if you open it, for example, in QGIS. And those are grid code, which is the class number, then UTME and UTMN. These are the coordinates in the VGS84 UTM zone 20 south projection, which is the same exact projection as our input data set. I have not mentioned this before. But it is vitally important for all our data sets, the stack data set, as well as the training and validation point data sets, to be in the same geometry. There is ways how you can fix the geometry or fix the projection in Python, but I am not addressing them here. So if you run this code, all your, of your input data have to be in the same projection. Finally, the last column 
is geometry, which contains, again, the geometry of the point. In the next step, we simply index the points that we have loaded, and then we use these columns, the UTM-E and UTM-N, to create a coordinate list, which basically has the form of list with X and Y coordinates for each of the points. Then we will add a new column into our data frame, which we have created here in GeoPandas, and this column will be called raster value. Now for each of the coordinate pairs that we have saved in the chords list, we will go into our data set that we have created right here into our memory data set, and we will sample each band at these specific coordinates. In this way, we extract the values of all of the bands for all of the training points. This means that for each point in our data set, we will have 104 band values. However, here we extracted all of them into a single column in our data frame. In the next step, we unpack this single column that for each point contains a list of these values so that the values are now in a separate columns. We will use for this the band names. Now we will create a column for each of these bands, use this name of the band as a name of the column, and unwrap the list of our values so that for each column we have one value corresponding to that specific band. Finally, we can now remove the raster value column because we no longer need it. In the next part, we also choose to resample or replace some values in our grid code, which remember is the class number. Now the classes that we have in our training data have numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 7, 8, and 15. For ease of visualization later, we will simply reclassify the last three values, so 7, 8, and 15, to 5, 6, and 7, so the values are basically consecutive. You can see it right here. So this is our original class numbers, and this will be our new class numbers. And then finally, we will save our training point data set or training data set into a CSV, just in case we need to reuse it later and we don't want to extract it again. It will simply be saved into the same folder as the Jupyter Notebook. And then we visualize the first five lines of the data frame. So let's now run. Again, Control Enter, and here we go. And you can now see that we have a new file created here, and we also have the first five rows visualized. The full data set, however, is 108 columns. So of course, it's the 104 bands plus the four columns that we already had in our data set. And here we have five rows, but in reality, it contains 8,000 rows, 1,000 points for every class and eight classes. And you can also see some of the values for the bands. So for the Sentinel-2 data, the values are usually integers around 1,000 to 2,000. And then we have also the values for the sigma in the Sentinel-1 data, which on the other hand are very low values. This difference in the values is not really important, for example, for Random Forest or SVM, but it is important for the clustering algorithm, and we will in the future need to normalize the data. But I will talk about that later. Now we can check whether the resampling or reclassification of our values run correctly. And we will simply just look at the unique values that are now present in our class numbers. Next, I thought it would be interesting to plot the class profiles over our data set from September 2018 to June 2019. We can calculate a mean value for each of the classes in each band by running this simple group by and then grid code, so group by class, and then calculating mean. Then we create a figure and we also do not plot each of the incidences of each band separately, but we will just group them by the band number or by the polarization. Instead, each of the incidences of, for example, band two will be one point on the x-axis 
meaning that basically it creates a timeline for us. Okay, so we loop over the band names here, and for each we create a figure, and for each figure we extract the band values that correspond to, for example, band 2. So remember we have 10 times Sentinel 2, so 10 times band 2, and then we plot the mean values over the time series for each class. Okay, so let's again run the code, and here we go. We have also added a legend with the same color map that we have defined above. And we can now see that the mast class, for example, is black. And for example, the maze is blue here and so on and so on. So you can investigate each of these graphs. And we can also see that in each band, we of course have a slightly different temporal profile. Now the profiles here are of course a little bit deformed since we are plotting them in equal intervals. However, as you remember from the presentation, our data, either Sentinel-2 or Sentinel-1, have not actually been acquired in equal intervals over our study period. However, at least the graphs give us an overview of the separability of the classes in each of the bands. Interestingly, for example, if we look at the VH and VV polarizations, you can see that in SAR, many of the classes have quite similar profiles, but for example, the natural woody vegetation has values that are significantly higher than for all the other classes. I will not go too much into detail here, but you can certainly investigate this later and see how it ties to your data set. Finally, we have the training data set now created and extracted. However, this is still not in the format that we can use later in the classification. What we need to do now is split the data set into Y and X values. The Y values, of course, are the class numbers, and the X values contain the features that we will feed into the random forest or SVM, for example. So here in the first line, we create a list of labels for our training points. And below, we create X data set containing the feature columns. Remember, features correspond to bands. So we have 104 bands. But I thought also it might be interesting to see the difference between classifying only Sentinel-1 data, only Sentinel-2 data, and all Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data. We will basically use our list of bands to separate between which features belong to Sentinel-1, which features belong to Sentinel-2, and then use all of them for the final one. I have not created three different variables. Instead, I have created a list into which the three different variables are saved. So we have a list X, and then to the list, I append the data set, which only contains the training columns with Sentinel-1 data. Then second in the list is the data set that contains only the Sentinel-2 data. And third is the complete set of features or all of our 104 bands for all of the 1,000 points. Then just to save some space or save some memory, I delete the original train PTS data set. So the original training data set that we have used, for example, for visualization of these graphs. And I also delete the coordinate data set since we will not need them anymore. So let me run this code cell again. Here we go. And finally, here in the last part of the training data extraction, we will just check the shapes of each of the parts in our X data set list. And here we go. So the training data sizes are the Sentinel stack, 8,000 rows, and 44 columns, or 44 features. Sentinel-2 stack is 8,000 rows, all of our training points, and 60 bands, or 60 features. And then Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, 8,000 rows and 104 features. So our training data are ready now, and we will extract our validation data set. I will not go again to the same detail, since the process is exactly the same, the only thing that is different is here that we are using the validation points, so the 200 points per class, instead of the training points. 
Otherwise, the steps are identical to the extraction of the training data. So let me just quickly run all of them. Here we go. Then we will split our data set again, exactly the same. We now have a list which is called X valid, and we append the three data sets for only Sentinel-1, only Sentinel-2, and both Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. So let's again run it. And finally, let's check the shapes. Here we go. And now the sizes. So I mentioned that we have 200 points per class. But actually, for some classes, there was actually not enough polygons in the validation data we could sample. And therefore, for some classes, we have slightly less points than for others. And with this, we are now to the part of the actual classification. Our training and validation data are prepared, and we can move on to the random forest. So here I again include some information about random forest. It is more or less the same that I've already mentioned in the presentation, but in case you are interested, you can find it here. As I've already mentioned, we use the scikit-learn library for our machine learning operations or machine learning algorithms. And I always include also the default parameters and shape of the command. So here you can find the list of all the default parameters. Some of them I have mentioned during the presentation, but we will only use the number of estimators and the OOB or out of bag score. So in the next cell, we will train our classifier. First, we have to import the classifier from sklearn or scikit-learn ensemble. And the classifier, of course, is random forest classifier. Since we want to train the classifier on three different data sets, remember only Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and the combined data set, I create again a list into which the trained models will be saved. Then I loop over the three feature data sets that we have and fit each into a random forest model and then save this model into the list. Here, I call the random forest instance and I ask it to create 300 trees. And I also set the out of bag score calculation to true. Otherwise, we will not get the out of bag score after the training. I also include here the parameter maximum features. This is just because I was previously testing this parameter, but you can see that it's actually set to the default value of auto. Here we have it. Here, in the next step, once we create the instance of the random forest, here we will fit it to the values. So we will feed it one of the input data sets, depending on where the loop is, and then we feed it the class labels. So let's now run it. And the output will be the trained models, of course, and printed out of back accuracy below the cell for each of the data sets. And here we go. And we can now see that the accuracy or out of back accuracy for our Sentinel-1 stack during the training was 81, sorry, 87.6%. For the Sentinel-2 stack, it is higher. It is 90.5% approximately. And it's highest for the stack, approximately 91.3%. Now, this is the out of bag accuracy, but as I have mentioned during the presentation, the model always needs the independent validation because the predictions made for the out of bag accuracy have not come from all the trees, but rather only from a subset of the trees. So, that is our next step here, where we will validate our model using an independent validation data set that we have again prepared above. So, these validation points, as I've mentioned before, were extracted from a completely different polygons than our training data, but the polygons were sampled in the same way, randomly sampled to include maximum 200 points per class, depending on the size of the polygons that we had. Here we can import the classification report, which is a function of the sklearn or scikit-learn metrics, and we will use it to build our report. So here we create, again, three labels for each of our stacks, just to have clear distinction between the different classification reports. 
And for all of our stacks, we take our trained models and we use them to predict the classes for our validation feature set. And then we simply print the label that we have here and the classification report for each of these. In the classification report, you need to supply the Y valid, which contains the actual classes taken from our validation points, and then our predicted classes that our trained algorithms have provided here. Finally, we can also provide the class names if we don't only want to use the numbers. So let's run it. And here we go. It's a very short process. And we can now see here, for example, for Sentinel-1, this is the classification report for Sentinel-1. And we have for each class, the precision, the recall, and the F1 score. For us, the most important, of course, the, is the F1 score or accuracy per class, and also the overall accuracy, as well as the number of points that we have for each class in our validation data set. You can see that, for example, for winter crop maize, we had very few points because we had very few polygons in our study area that actually had this crop. We seem to have very high accuracy for the natural woody vegetation, 94%, and also for the mast class, which consists of the water bodies, wetlands, and urban areas, and also, for example, for the soybean crop. For the other classes, we have various levels of accuracy. For some, it is very bad, for example, for the maize, but this can also be due to the fact that, again, we have very few original polygons. And if this one polygon, for example, that we have in our validation data is misclassified, then, then of course, we will have a low accuracy. This is not an excuse. We should always have our validation data as well as training data very highly quality controlled, as I've mentioned. But remember here also, our training data set is not actual field data, which would be the most reliable and most precise and most controllable, but rather it is already processed and classified data also using random forest. So any errors that were in the original classification will simply propagate into our classification now, which can also be responsible for relatively low overall accuracy. For Sentinel-2 stack, the accuracy is actually very similar, slightly lower here, but this can be due to the fact that we have fewer images and these images are not fitting well with the crucial times in the crop growth cycle, which would then uh, allow us to differentiate them. For the stack, we have the highest accuracy, it's still quite low, but we have the highest accuracy for the combined stack of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Now, to improve the accuracy, we can try to change the number of trees. For example, increase the number of trees or change some other parameters. But mostly, I believe in this case, it is caused by the training and validation data set that would have to be more quality controlled in order to give us better results. Now we have our trained model. We know what the accuracy or overall accuracy of the model is and what the accuracy of the classes is. And now we can use this model, if we are happy with it, to classify the rest of the image. Before we feed our image data set to the model, we need to take the full image and reshape it into 2D array in which each band will be basically a single line of numbers. This is necessary for the classification and we cannot avoid it. You also may need to reduce the size of our study area at this step. Since this step takes a lot of memory and it takes quite a long time, and you can at this point decrease the size of our data set by simply subsetting it to a specific smaller area. Here, we will reread our data set into a stack of NumPy arrays again. I have done this step before, but just to remind you, we read it into the same variable so it will not consume more memory. And we print the shape so we see the shape of the original product. Then we use reshape as image function, which will reshape the stack in a way that we first have, have the number of rows, then number of columns, and then the number of bands. Finally, we can use the first two, so the rows and columns, 
to create a 2D array. Since we want to do exactly the same as we have done before, so classify our data using the different subsets, so Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and all of the bands, we have to select the specific subsets that we want to use for the classification. So the first one is, of course, the stack of Sentinel-1 bands. Here, I again use the bands list to find the index number at which our Sentinel-1 bands start. Now, of course, we now know that this is at 60. We have discussed this in the beginning when we were visualizing the data. But for example, if in SNAP you decrease the number of images that you stack in your stacked input data set, this can change. Therefore, this approach, looking at the band name, we can find the index where the band values start. For this, I use the sigma naught because this is a pattern that is contained in the name of our bands. And for the Sentinel-2, I use the pattern B. Again, we have B2, B3, and so on for the name of the bands. Then I create three separate data sets, which are the ones that are the input for the model and are reshaped into the 2D array. What happens now is that we can feed these input data sets into the classification. First, let me run this reshape part, so reshaped cell. And here we go. Now we can start with the image classification. We have three now, here the Sentinel-1 classification, Sentinel-2 classification, and the combined stack classification. And for each stack, we load the model, so the trained model corresponding to that one stack. Then we use this, the model to predict the class input that we have created above. And finally, we reshape it back into an image form. Now, these three take very long time to run. So I have shortened it here, but do not be alarmed when you're repeating this exercise if this can take approximately 30 minutes per cell. So let me now run, and I will run all of them. Here we go. And we now have to wait a little bit. And here we go. The classification of our images has completed. Now, as I said, I speeded it up significantly. So on a normal machine, it can take somewhere between 20 to 30 minutes. And we can now visualize our results. And we start with creating a figure where we will have three subplots. So for each data set, we have one subplot. Then we set a title for each. And finally, here we also for each visualize the result of the classification. And we assigned the color map that we have created in the beginning of the script. Then we also attach a legend and we can visualize our data. So control enter and here we go. We now have three classification images. They actually look very similar. The accuracies were also very similar. So we expect the results to be um, more or less the same. We, of course, have some differences in values, for example, between the Sentinel-1 classification and the Sentinel-2 classification for the simple reason that Sentinel-1 has the underlying resolution of 20 by 22 meters, even though it's provided with a pixel size of 10 meters, the same as Sentinel-2 data. Now, consideration also has to be given to the inherent speckle which is present in all radar images. And even though we have applied speckle filter, there is going to be still some residual random pixels around that are then classified into the wrong classes, for example. You can see that compared to the Sentinel-1, the Sentinel-2 classification appears a little bit more cleaner. The polygons are a little bit more uniform or homogeneous. And for the combined classification, this result actually appears to be the best. And here we have the legend below. Now, here the images are quite small and they are only visualizations. We cannot do much with them. So let's us now save these images into a GeoTIFF file. And we do that again with Rasterio. 
and I will simply save each of the classifications as a band in a new image. So the GeoTIFF is going to have the same profile or properties as our original input image. Then the only thing that we change is the data type. So we no longer need float data type. We can simply use 8-bit unsigned integer. We also don't have 104 bands anymore, but we have three. So for each classification, one. And we then open this new data set, the Crasterio. We save it as rfclassification.tiff, open it for writing, and then we write each of the bands. We have the band numbers here, and we have the specific data that we want to write, and we write it as a unsigned integer. So let me run it. And here we go. And you see it's very quick. And here we have our data set. And now we are done with a random forest, and we can move on to the support vector machine. Again, I have a few words here about the support vector machine, as well as the function that we use, again, from the scikit-learn library. And we have also here the default values. In this case, I will use all the default values only. But of course, when you're trying, you can change the values, for example, for the regularization parameter C, to see how much it will change your classification. First, same as for the random forest, we need to train our classifier. Again, we will loop over our three input data sets, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and combined stack. And we will train the SVM model for each and append it to a list of models. So let's do this. OK. Our model is now trained. You can see that here we do not have any option of out of back score. Um, unfortunately, SVM, due to its concept already, does not allow for this. But we can run the model validation with our validation data, same as we have done for the random forest. I will not go through it again. It's basically the same piece of code, only now we are using the SVM models trained in the previous cell. So let's run it, and here we go. So we can see now that for Sentinel-1 only, again, we have very low accuracy for some classes and very high accuracy for some others. And the overall accuracy is about 60%. For Sentinel-2, this is already significantly higher, 70%. And we also have higher accuracy in some of the classes that have are giving us a real problem only with Sentinel-1. This can be due to various factors. I have already discussed them in the random forest, but it seems that SVM is doing a better job in classifying our data, our data set in this case. Now, if we look at the accuracy of the combined stack, we have overall value that is even slightly higher than just for Sentinel-2. Although the actual class accuracies are somewhat little more erratic, I would say, because, for example, we have some classes with lower accuracy than for only Sentinel-2 and some classes with slightly higher accuracy than only for Sentinel-2. OK, so if we are now happy with our model, we can do the same as we have done for the random forest, and that is to classify the rest of our image. And again, we are going to be using only the Sentinel-1 stack, only the Sentinel-2 stack, and both combined. Again, this step here takes a significant amount of time, even longer than the classification in Random Forest. It can take approximately an hour for each of these cells to run. So do not be alarmed if that happens to you. You just have to let it run. I will run all the three cells. They will run consecutively, but at least I do not need to pay attention to it all the time and I can just wait for it to be processed. As I said here, of course, for the purposes of this demonstration, we speed it up significantly. And here we go. So the classification of our image for all the three subsets is finished, and we can now visualize the results. Again, the code is the same as for the random forest. Simply, we create three subplots each for one of the classifications. So let me run this step as well. And again, we apply the same 
color map that we have created above and that we have used for the random forest results as well. Here we can see a little bit more the fragmentation due to the SAR speckle. For example, we can see here the values are much more fragmented than they are in the Sentinel-2 or in the combined classification. So in the end, the combined classification actually gives us the cleanest view on our image. Most of the fields are actually clean classified, which in the end on crop classification of this scale is always important. Finally, we will write again the output into a TIFF file. We can visualize then later in SNAP or QGIS. So let me run this part as well. And we can see that now a new TIFF file has been added here into my folder. The final classification, or in this case actually clustering, is going to be run with the k-means unsupervised method. Before we can run the k-means clustering, we should first normalize or rather standardize our data set. Now normalizing usually means scaling our data to bring the values into the range between 0 and 1 which is done by subtracting the minimum value from every value and then dividing the result by the maximum value minus the minimum value. However, in machine learning, another method called standard score or standardization is usually used. And here we first calculate the mean and the standard deviation of the data set and then subtract the mean from every value and divide the result by the standard deviation. We will perform this scaling in this step here, and we will use a tool again from the scikit-learn library, which is called Standard Scaler. Here we will read in again our data set, and then for each of the features or bands in our data set, we will fit the standard scaler. When the scaler is fitted, the mean and standard deviation values are calculated, and we can then use the transform function to apply this to the entire data set. Finally, we append the normalized band into a list that we call normalized. And in the end, we convert this list of arrays into a NumPy array stack. We can then take this stack and reshape it the same way as we have done previously for the inputs for random forest and for SVM. Finally, we will simply print the output shape just to check that all our steps performed well. So let me now run this piece of code. OK, so the shape of our output array looks fine, and we can now feed it into the clustering algorithm. Again, the clustering algorithm k-means is implemented in scikit-learn library, and we use the number of clusters as 10. This is simply given by the number of classes that we have, plus three classes included in the mast class, which were the wetlands, the water bodies, and the urban areas. These will, of course, have quite different signatures in our data set, and therefore it does not make sense to have them included in the same cluster for the clustering. So this gives us, in the end, 10 clusters, and we can now run the algorithm on our input created in the previous step. OK, and my clustering is done. This step normally takes also approximately 5 to 10 minutes. Now we have our clustering finished, and let's now visualize our results. Here we simply create two subplots, and in one we visualize a Sentinel-2 true color composite of the image, and in the other the cluster map. So let me simply run. And here we go. We can now see that we have very clear patterns in the fields. And clearly, we have several different types of crop or surface on those fields. We also have clearly distinguished forest areas or woody, natural woody vegetation in blue here, and also water bodies in pink. And then we have many other areas which would correspond to the wetlands and the other classes in the masked class. For example, here we have our 
urban area, which again, we have approximately three different clusters present in this area. I will not go more into how to link this result to actual classes, but since we do have training data, you can try to see which points correspond to which cluster here on the image and assign classes based on that. Finally, we can export our results again into a TIFF file, same as we have done for the random forest and SVM. So let me run this final step. And we now have the three different classification or clustering results here in our folder. If you want to visualize them in SNAP, I have also included here this classification CPD file, which is basically the color map used for the classification, for the visualization of the classifications in the code. And this one, this file can be used to pass the same color map into SNAP using the color manipulation tab. Finally, we have classified the Earth observation data using the field data, and we are ready to create the final product. This is, as you can see here, this is the final step in the overall crop inventory operational methodology. Once the classifications are completed, AAFC moves through a post-processing process to refine the thematic map products, test the accuracy of the assessment, and publish the map product. The process is to one, merge the agriculture and non-agriculture classes, two, filter the classified product, three, mosaic by province, four, complete a visual assessment, five, burn your permanent classes into the product, do six, complete an accuracy assessment, seven, write the metadata, and eight, publish a map, map product. The first step is to merge the classification with the land cover and classification with the various crop classes to form a final product that contains both the crop and the land cover classes together. At AFC, we classify our land covers separately from our agricultural classes, and at the end, we must combine them. You can see here the land cover, generalized land cover, is on the left. There is a generalized agricultural class in that land cover, which is then subsequently merged with the crop in the middle classifications to form the final classification, as you can see on the right. The second step is to filter the map product. So AFC uses a pixel-based classification, which can sometimes result in orphan pixels within a classified field. A mode filter is applied to reassign those orphan pixels to a majority class. So remember to consider your field sizes when you're selecting a kernel or window size for your mode filter. And you should also think about instances where orphan pixels might make sense and should not be mode filtered. So for example, if you have intercropping, if you have big trees in the middle of fields, if you have water bodies within the middle of fields, sometimes those pixels make sense. Here you can see on the left our raw classification prior to mode filtering, and then on the right, our final filtered classification. It's much smoother in the fields and there are not a lot of missing uh, in orphan pixels. The third step is to mosaic all the regions within one province and then create a complete countrywide product by mosaic all between all of the provinces. As we mentioned earlier, we classify in regions to, making, to make processing efficient. Where regions and provinces meet, the seams should be checked to ensure that the class types are consistent across seams and that there are no errors. So on the left here, you can see what our individual stacks over of regions look like within the Quebec mosaic uh, process. 
And on the right, you can see the final mosaic product. A fourth step is to apply a visual assessment. AAFC Operations undertakes a manual visual inspection and revision, but only for major errors. Given the operational nature of the ACI, it is important to balance map quality and resources, or otherwise known as analyst time. The area inside the red polygon underestimates the amount of agricultural fields compared to the previous year. This error was detected by visual inspection and then was corrected by the analyst. Because the AFC classifies in regions and those regions overlap, we can actually take one of another region that the classifier produced in order to correct these overlap issues. Our fifth step is to burn our permanent classes. So permanent classes can include things that do not change, such as roads or greenhouses, solar panel farms, go golf courses, for example. We have these areas classified as a general layer, and then we can add them to the overall final classification product. The sixth step is to use the validation data that we set aside, the 30%, and complete an accuracy assessment. The accuracy assessment is completed for the specific crop classes and contains measures of a confusion matrix, user's accuracy, producer's accuracy, overall accuracy for the map product, and a kappa coefficient. A confusion matrix compares reference data with the classification data, so validation data with the training data, and contains rows and columns representing the number of classes. This matrix provides information regarding the errors of emission, so inclusion of pixels from a class, or conversely known as the producer's accuracy, and errors of commission, erroneous inclusion of pixels into a class, or conversely, the user's accuracy, which is 100% less the percent errors of commission. Literature re recommends that the target of 85% overall accuracy and at least a 70% users and producers accuracy for each class be achieved. The ACI, as we said, strives for an 85% over overall accuracy. In general, our overall accuracies and our users and producers accuracies for crop types are much higher than these, upwards of 90% and higher in most regions. It also depends on the year and the availability of data and field data. Another measure of accuracy is a kappa coefficient, which is an agreement which, is, which indicates the accuracy of the map beyond which would have been attained by a random assignment of pixels to a land cover class. Alike overall accuracy, Kappa incorporates the errors of commission and omission and can be used if you're comparing your error matrices or confusion matrices. These results are all published along with the MATIC map for future users. The seventh step is to write the metadata. The metadata for the thematic crop inventory is published. This includes an overview of the whole methodology of, to create the thematic map. It gives the overall accuracies per province, and it gives the individual crop accuracies can be obtained upon request. Also, as Canada is a bilingual country, translation is made for all the geospatial products that are produced, the thematic maps, and for the metadata. So you can see here in the table that we have all the information in the abstract of how the data was produced, and then all the supplemental information, which gives you overall provincial accuracies for crop classes. The finally, the last step is the publication of the thematic map to opencanada.ca. This is a portal provided by the Government of Canada where all persons can go and obtain and download geospatial uh, data of the annual crop inventory. Now I will show you a brief demonstration of opencanada.ca. When you go to open.canada.ca, you come to this main page, 
And here, under this box, you can indicate what you're searching for. In our scenario, we would like to see annual crop inventory. And all the records of the annual crop inventory are then displayed. The annual crop inventory on the opencanada.ca comes up in two formats, by individual year or underneath an entire general umbrella of annual crop inventory. We click on that option, and then we're given the options for what are available. So in this scenario, we have prepackaged GeoTIFF files, and we are able to click on that and click on the URL, and we're able to download any of the prepackaged GeoTIFF files for any of the provinces for any of the years. So for example, this is the ACI 2020 for Alberta AB from, uh, and it will give you the last data modification. Because we don't simply leave these as stagnant products, we often go back and review and improve as we can um, with inclusive, including new methods or including new filtering or including uh, new training and validation data and updating and improving our maps as we go. But these are now available from 2009 all the way to 2020 at this portal. And remember, we will have this training video on the web page within 24 hours so that you will be able to go through this at your own pace. So I thank you very much for listening and learning about the annual crop inventory and listening to how to do a crop inventory. And we will now send it back to our host. Thank you, Laura, for a terrific overview on how Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada performs post-processing steps on classified images, performs accuracy ass assessment, and publishes the results from Canada's annual crop inventory to Open Canada. It's great to see how Canada is using radar and optical imagery operationally in conducting your, your annual crop inventories and making that data available to the general public. I'd like to see more countries doing that. We will now transition to the question and answer session of today's training. Please enter your questions in the question and answer box and we will get to them in the order that they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. Below is the contact info information for, for Teresa Roth, Georgia Karadimu, and Dr. Laura Dingle Robertson, along with links to the training webpage and the European Space Agency's EO for Society website. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you to for everybody that's been submitting your questions. We've got some really terrific ones coming in throughout today's webinar. So jumping right into it, uh, question number one, can you get training data from high resolution satellite data? If yes, how does a non-agricultural person who has not identified crops identify from imagery? Um, so yes, you can. Uh, if you do not have in-situ training data, the safest identification you can do uh, is by simply viewing satellite imagery uh, is to identify whether an area contains a crop or not, but you cannot securely identify the type of the crop. And question number two, what is the difference between overall accuracy and the F-score in accuracy assessment? And the answer is the F-score is calculated per class. And this means that we can see how well our algorithm performs for each class and not only overall. The overall accuracy can be very misleading since some classes can have accuracy that is extremely low, indicating potential issues in our training data or in their size, while other classes may have very high accuracy. And question number three, is there a relationship between the minimum number of samples and the number of trees in random forest classification training? And the answer number three is not necessarily. There is a relationship between the number of features in your data set and the number of trees. The more dimensions in your data set, 
the more trees should be used. If your training data set is too small, uh, and this is meaning a number of samples, it makes no sense to have a high number of trees because the samples will repeat in the random sampling. All great questions. Thank you to everybody that's been submitting them. Please do keep submitting them. Uh, we will get to them in the coming 30 minutes. So question number four. I want to perform segmentation after object-based classification using NDVI temporal stack. How could one perform this using Sentinel-2 data? And the answer to that is there are segmenta segmentation tools available within SNAP uh, within the Orfeo toolbox plugin. And so we recommend you test that on their own with the, the Orfeo uh, toolbox plugin. And question number five. For those classification algorithms, when we use, for example, entropy instead of Gini, which increases the computational time? Does it necessarily mean better results? And answer to question number five is no. Based on the literature and testing, the results tend to be very similar. So question number six, uh, the Alaska Satellite Facility offers vertex on-demand radiometric terrain corrected Sentinel-1 data. Should we use Alaska Satellite Facility Vertex <laughs> radio, radiometric terrain corrected processed data sets when selecting radar data for crop mapping, especially crops on steep slopes? Mm -hmm. So because the SARs uh, are side looking instruments, these data are affected by topographic and radiometric distortions, such as, for example, layover, foreshortening or shadowing, and in regions, of, especially in regions with significant topography. It is possible to apply a, a terrain correction during SAR preprocessing. Uh, you saw that in part three. However, it is convenient to access the Sentinel data from uh, ASF uh, because it already has the, uh, the corrections applied. Keep in mind that the radiometric distortions in mountain, mountainous areas are very difficult to correct, so you will never get a perfect result. Nevertheless, um, we would recommend that you evaluate the uh, Alaska Satellite Facility corrected products to determine um, if these products meet your needs. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, Teresa. Thanks so much. Uh, question number seven. Can we measure the salinity of soil using biophysical variables for soil brightness? If not, which index may be the proper to use for soil salinity? Mm -hmm. so, the, so the soil adjusted vegetation index has been used for uh, in some research studies to estimate soil salinity. Uh, you can find the uh, literature uh, or you can search for the literature for these studies um, which have tested SABI for this purpose. However, personally, I do not have any experience with it, so I cannot, uh, I cannot answer this question to you. Okay, question number eight. Is it possible to know the final decision rule or rules of the trained random forest classifier? Mm -hmm. So there's some functions in Python that allow you the visualization of the entire tree and all the rules that have been used in each node. Uh, I cannot recall now what they are called. However, um, I would not recommend using those when classifying EO images as the trees will be extremely large and the values are, um, let's say, continuous. So um, of course, you will have uh, you will have trees that are really large, and um, you can test these uh, these tools. For example, with smaller data sets, such as uh, the data set, or not even a data set, but the example that I showed you in the presentation, which de dealt with fruits. There's also many more data sets that you can find online um, that can allow you to to do this. But I would not recommend trying this with the EO images, especially not with data set that has as many features as we have or as many bands. Wonderful. And question number nine, are OOB score and OOB error different? Could you please provide a clarification? Right. So OOB score generally refers to, to the portion to the, of the results that is correct, while OOB error um, refers to the portion of the results um, uh, in the uh, out of back um, uh, calculation, which is incorrect. So basically OOB error is just uh, when you subtract OB one from, uh, sorry, uh, OB score from one, so. Okay, wonderful. And question number 10, 
What if two features have the same distance from the z-plane in the sport vector machine classification? Right, so um, I think that happens quite rarely, depends on what data you are using. But of course, the SVM considers multiple, not just one. Uh, I, I assume that here you mean by features, you mean points or data points. So uh, of course, the SVM never considers uh, just one um, just one data point uh, to place the to place the hyperplane. So it always considers the all the support vectors, um, which are the closest points to the hyperplane or to the division line, let's say. So um, then other points will take the role of maximizing, will be used to maximize the margin. Great, and we looks like we have another question on SVM. So question number 11, are both SVM and K-means based on distance? Yes, yes, they are both based on distance. However, they use quite different approaches um, for the classification or clustering in this case, in the K-means case. Oh, wonderful, question number 12. Uh, Sentinel-2 shortwave infrared bands, are they resampled to 10 meters or downscale? So they're simply resampled. The data, uh, so the shortwave infrared bands are 20 meter resolution. So uh, they can, downscaling would not help us, that that would be lowering the resolution further. And we want to get them to 10 meters, so they're simply resampled. Great. At least yeah. in the, in the ex exercise. <laughs> Wonderful. And question number 13, if the training data is based on the classified image, how will the machine learning capture the temporal change in crop class? Right, so I didn't quite understand the question here. So of course the training data are based on classified image. It would have been better if the data were um, based on, uh, on, uh, on um, a field survey. However, anyway, even if you have field survey, you will generally have only one in the season, maximum two, but generally just one. And uh, that means that still your training data are uh, stationary in time. However, your data set includes multiple, of course, includes a time series over the span of your season. And the training data that we create in the Python, uh, I think this question was asked before we discussed this, uh, the training data that we create, we also sample all our data sets and basically for each training data point, we also extract all the values from all the bands or features that we have in our input data set. So there then in these features, you can of course, over the time series, see the time uh, or the, the temporal change in, uh, in, the, uh, in the values. Question 14, how can we identify outliers in the k-mean approach? Okay, so um, when you're um, define, I mean, when you use the k-means based outlier detection technique, the data are first partitioned into groups by assigning them to the closest cluster center, and once they are assigned, uh, we then compute the distance or the dissimilarity between each object and its cluster center, or each point and its cluster center. And of course, the outliers will be the one with the largest distan distances um, from the cluster centers. Okay, question 15. How can I get training data for my country or locality? Yes, so this can be difficult. Um, you can generally contact your local authorities or institutes that may happen to have such data. Uh, you can also find them um, publicly, sometimes publicly available, or they can make them publicly available. Uh, but each region around the world or each country have their own rules um, and data by, databases regarding uh, the publication of this data. Great, and also add to, uh, for question number 15, uh, for the answer, uh, there's also a really good website called Collect Earth Online that does have kind of like a crowdsourced um, institute gathering database that you can use as, a, as, a, as one uh, reference. So we do recommend that whoever asked that question. Uh, question 16, does SNAP fully support Mac M1 chip? So unfortunately, I, I don't know, but uh, you can refer to the uh, SNAP uh, step forum. Uh, you can find the link in the chat. And there you should be, if you don't find answers specifically, you should be definitely able to ask the question. 
Um, otherwise, there is a Mac version of uh, of Snap, but I'm not familiar with Mac per se, so I don't know if uh, that is exactly what you're asking. Okay, question number 17. For regression random forest, is it sufficient to perform tuning in N estimators, M try, and extract important features using recursive feature elim elimination algorithm? Assuming that I split data to 80% for training and 20% for test slash validation, is it enough to produce significant accuracy or, uh, or I have to optimize tree depth and include the bootstrap aggregation in any case? So um, that is difficult to say. I have not tested this and I don't know from the top of my head if, uh, if this will, I mean, it's difficult to know if this would give you a good accuracy. Um, generally, you will have to test, unfortunately. Um, the bootstrapping is uh, usually important in a random forest since it um, basically minimizes the chances of overfitting. Um, and it moreover makes your classifier more robust. So if you then apply your classifier to not only your training data, but your full image, for example, uh, the bootstrapping really uh, improves the accuracy in this case. and um, lowers the chances of the overfitting to only the training data, let's say. Question 18. Can we subset by importing a shapefile or JSON file for a region of interest? So in SNAP, unfortunately, no. Um, you can, however, use tools. There's um, several online tools. I believe one of them is called Bicket. Um, and uh, or, for example, QGIS to convert your uh, JSON file or your shape file into a well-known text format, which can be used in Snap, but only in the graph interface. So if you're using the, um, the just the general tool that you can find in the drop-down menu in Snap, uh, there, unfortunately, it's not possible. You can only define the, uh, the corner coordinates um, of, your, of your polygon. Now, this is only for subsetting, so it will always take a rectangle uh, of your uh, out of your data. It will not clip them into your polygon by no means. Okay, question number 19 looks like it appears to do with the processing time of your machine. So batch processing seems to take a long time collectively, per se for five uh, Sentinel-2 images. I noticed the processing of one by one takes less time in total, but of course, there is less effort needed for batch processing. Snap tends to also lag a lot when handling large files, as noticed from last week's practical week two data. Does Snap require a super high performance computer to run with ease? Um, no, I don't think it does. Uh, there are some issues indeed with Snap. So um, the, the using the batch processing um, at the GUI of the Snap is relatively slower. Um, then running it um, from the GPT, which is the command line interface, which we have not, I'm not sure that uh, it was shown in the, in the previous uh, sessions. Um, because, so therefore sometimes it, you may face slower performance batch processing um, than, than processing them one by one. And this is because Snap does not release memory in the batch processing, the Snap graphical interface. So the minimum required RAM to use Snap is generally uh, eight to uh, eight gigabytes, 16 is providing very good performance. But of course, the more available uh, memory you have, the better or the faster processing you will, uh, you, will, you will get or the faster the processing will get. However, I would really recommend looking into the GPT. Um, it's, uh, it's much faster and it basically, um, it can, so it does not have built-in batch processing, but you can simply script it whether using uh, Python or using, um, using a shell script, for example, and it uses the same graphs as the, um, as the graphical interface, again, with few changes. Uh, here, again, I don't know if it was addressed before, but I can refer you to some training, um, uh, some webinars or some um, materials that we have published on the Rus Copernicus website. And uh, there you can find, because we very um, frequently use this, this method. I, I don't have now one in mind that I would tell you this one is the one that we used it. But you, if you check the PDFs that we publish, you should definitely be able to find an example of the shell script, for example, and how to edit the graph file. 
Great, question 20. I see that Rus Copernicus has a lot of great training material, but training sessions are only for Europeans. Any chance to make the training information available globally? Right, so the Rus Copernicus material, so the PDF guide and the video, and also the attendance to the webinars are available to everybody. So those are not limited to Europe at all. Um, unfortunately, the virtual machine availability is limited to EU citizens. That is based on the regulations of the project, and unfortunately, we cannot change it. But as I said, the webinars and all the materials coming from the webinars are publicly available. Wonderful. And we do hope that uh, all the participants uh, check out the Rus Copernicus website and definitely uh, you know, explore all those uh, wonderful trainings that they have uh, uploaded on there. So question 21, doesn't SNAP have its own machine learning classifier tool? Um, yeah, so um, the SVM and the random forest are available in SNAP and there might be also k-means, I'm not right now sure. Um, but Generally, I found them a little bit finicky to use. There is less parameters that you can optimize. Uh, and the output data set does not, for example, retain the same class numbers. And you have to import your training data per class as the vectors divided uh, per class. Uh, and it only considers the name of the vector that you import, not the actual values um, or not the actual grid code or anything that you supply. So it, it is a little bit tricky to use. It might be simpler because it requires less parameters. Uh, however, I, I generally prefer using Python or different software than Snap for this. Question 22, is it possible to perform a spectral separability analysis in Snap using some distances like Jeffrey's Matu Matusita? Um, Again, I would refer you to the SNAP forum. I'm not uh, familiar uh, with, uh, with the spectral analysis tool in SNAP or whether there is one available. So unfortunately, sorry, I cannot answer this question. OK, question 23. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, uh, both uh, Laura and Teresa. Uh, is it possible to provide a, a YAML file as well? Yes, so the YML file is available in the training kit. So you can simply send an email to the EO training at serco.com and we will send you the training kit. Um, and I believe this question is repeated many times uh, for different uh, for different parts of the training kit, but definitely just forward us an email and we will send you um, the, the training kit, including this file. Okay, and it looks like question 24 is very similar. So how do you get the Jupyter Notebook? And, and again, uh, we'll refer you to the email that Teresa just referenced in the previous question. So question 25, can the starting data files that the presenter is using be available to run and validate the Python used? If the combination fails, then the Python may not run the same. Um, okay, so I now when I read it, I think I might, might have misunderstood the question originally when I was writing the answer. So I, I'm not sure what uh, was meant by the starting data. Maybe you can specify it in, a, in again in a different question. Um, also, I don't understand what it means to, uh, what do you mean by validating the Python uh, used? Um, I'm sorry, I, I don't know, but you can, I don't understand the question, but you can definitely download the, if you mean the, the input data set, um, that we used. Uh, this is uh, using the same method that you saw in part three, and the data has been included on the event web page where you can download them. This is only the um, co-registered Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 uh, data set that we used. And then you have the training kit, which contains the training data used and the Jupyter Notebook. So, so you should basically be able to repeat the exercise exactly, and there should not be any problems if you, if you manage to set up the environment correctly. Question 26, for people that are not familiar with coding, is there an alternative to running the data processing in Jupyter Lab elsewhere, for example, SNAP? Right, so as I've mentioned already, um, there the algorithms or the random forest and the, um, and the SVM at least are available in SNAP as well. I mentioned they have some limitations, uh, for example, to the parameters that can be set and also how to input the training data and so on. Um, so yes, you can you can use you can to to a, to a large degree you can um, repeat this entire process only in Snap. Yes. 
Question 27, what attributes should we provide in the training data shapefile? So in the training data shapefile, um, again, you can find this in the training kit. There is a point ID. This is um, not necessary to have, but uh, it comes with the shapefile. Then the grid code, which is the identifier of the class. So just a numerical value identifying the crop class. And then there is um, uh, UTM-E and UTM-N, which are the X and Y coordinates uh, in the UTM uh, zone. Uh, I believe this was 20S. Um, uh, based on VGS84 uh, coordinate system. So this is specific for this exercise, but it should be uh, basically the same coordinate system as your input data set. Wonderful. Question number 28. Concerning the random selection of training and validation points, how was it done? As I believe you have not clicked thousands of times on a map. Uh, no, so I used um, basically the data that I had from Laura were um, polygons um, so the original data were uh, were first vectorized by her and then uh, the, the, some polygons were selected uh, randomly but for me that was still too many uh, points uh, the the code would be way too slow so i decided to limit the number of points to 4000 per class and uh, i did this by um, using the random points inside the polygons inside polygons which is a tool that you can find in qgis and it enables you to um, basically set the number of samples to be drawn. Now, first, what I did was uh, dissolve all the features by all, all the polygons by class, meaning that I always had one single multi polygon per class. This is important because otherwise each of the polygons, uh, original polygons would be um, used to draw 1000 points, which is, of course, not possible. So you have to create one multi polygon per class by dissolving uh, by class. And then you can use this um, random sampling point in uh, QGIS. All of this was done in QGIS. Wonderful. Uh, great. Question number 29. Uh, just wondering if you have developed a module for classes, what is the basis for defining these classes in the notebook? Um, uh, again, I think I have misread uh, the question <laughs> when I was writing the answer. Um, so. Um, no, I did not def develop a module uh, for no, module for classes. No. Okay, question number thirty: For the seams and overlaps when mosaicing, how does one check the quality besides visual assessment? Um, right. So. Um, Basically, visual assessment is your best tool. Uh, I believe there is some advanced mosaicing methods, um, but again, um, I'm unfortunately not not uh, an expert on this. Um, but uh, generally, I mean, visual assessment will be will be your uh, one of the best checks you can do. Uh, but the advanced <clears throat> sorry, the advanced mosaicing tools can give you uh, better results for sure because then they will try to uh, equalize the, the change uh, on the border or the basically the, the distribution of the values in the mosaic images. And question 31 is a repeat from earlier, so I'll just run through it very quickly. Uh, they're just asking if the, the Jupyter Notebook from today will be made available. And again, uh, to repeat the answer, please send the email to the one provided at circo.com, and then you will receive the training kit along with the Jupyter Notebook. So uh, please do follow up with the uh, email provided. So question 32, is image normalization important for random forest classification? If yes, is there a way to determine the impact of non-normalized data on random forest classification? Uh, so no, normalization is not necessary in random forest. Random forest is nice this way that it allows you to uh, input data that are really on multiple different scales. Um, so you can um, you can just use, uh, yeah, uh, no, you don't need to normalize the data for random forest. Question 33, how are fields that are double or triple cropped dealt with in classification. If fields are double cropped with different crops, do you use data from both seasons when classifying one crop? Right, so I think this question is repeated then later as well uh, in a slightly different way. Um, and I have overlooked this one, but basically uh, general, I, I, I don't have experience with this, so I don't know. Maybe there would be um, others that, that have more experience, for example, um, uh, 
Laura uh, or Heather that gave the part three presentation. But uh, I would say that this will create a lot of problems. I mean, you can create probably um, a multi-crop class, um, but that will depend, that will really require that all the training points that you have within that class or all the date, all, all the changes in the crop within that season will uh, occur around the same time and will have a diff very similar temporal um, temporal response or temporal profile. Otherwise, uh, and then you would have to have this uh, multi-crop or double-cropped areas uh, in a specific different class. You cannot for sure, what is not possible is to have, um, I mean, if you have one training data set, which you will have per classification, you cannot have multiple classes for the same polygon. It's not, not, not possible um, uh, in that way. So um, either you can have specific classes that are uh, including these double cropped or um, multiple cropped um, areas, but then again, the properties of these multiple cropped areas within that class should be very similar. So the uh, algorithm can actually classify them. Great, question 34. Is there any tool for distinguishing between forest and crop? Um, so you can simply use classification again. Um, I mean, if your training data only includes um, forest areas and crop areas, then um, you will get two classes out of it, which will be uh, forest areas and crop areas. So it really depends. Um, I mean, I think classification in this case is the best tool you can use. Um, and even in our data, there is actually a, a forest class or permanent vegetation or permanent tree cover class. So we, in general, also, we were also classifying forest in this case, uh, apart from also the crop, uh, crop, different crops. Wonderful, question 35. Does SnapPy support Python 3.4 or later versions? I installed Snap 8.0 with Python 3.4, and I tried to install SnapPy with Python 3.7.6, and I couldn't install it. Um, so I am, I, I have never encountered this issue personally. I am using Snap 3.4, sorry, um, Python 3.4. Um, oh no, actually it's uh, Python 3.6, but I have used Python 3.4 before. Uh, what you can try is to install Snap 7, um, which I think you can find in the archive uh, on, on the on the Snap webpage. Um, might give you a different result, but I wonder if the issue is rather not related to something else. Um, you can also consult the forum, but uh, personally, I have not encountered uh, any issue with, I mean, if the Python is uh, version three or higher, uh, then um, it should not be an issue. Okay, uh, question 36. What should we do for croplands that have different crop types for different seasons when defining the training data? Um, right, so, uh, I mean, generally, you will always need to rerun the training of the classifier uh, for different seasons. Uh, you will have to have different training data for different seasons. That is just the way it unfortunately is. Um, so when you need to, when you define your uh, the season that you want to classify, you should have a single crop uh, per field. Or as I was mentioning before, you can have uh, mul specific multi-crop classes perhaps, but then the, um, the areas that include this multi-crop multi class have to be really similar um, or, uh, throughout your training data and also throughout your input data. So for example, if the change between crops occurs at exactly the same time, um, then you can create a class that specifically relates to this change between these two crops but otherwise, uh, unfortunately, we are all always limited to um, single training data set and uh, and uh, single uh, single season. Wonderful question thirty seven. How is the dimensionality reduction of data performed for supervised classification? Is feature engineering part of such analysis? Also, is principal component analysis the preferred way? Uh, right. So. Um, Unfortunately, I did not test this, uh, so I cannot really answer fully. Uh, but uh, in general, in literature, you will find that dimensionality reduction will have positive effect on classification, even if just reducing the uh, computational time. 
Um, but um, unfortunately, I cannot uh, cannot um, advise in this case. Question thirty eight: What is grid code? Is it crop type code? Um, yes, so it's basically just the numerical value assigned to the crop type. And question thirty nine: What kind of hyperparameter tuning is performed for, uh, for the model to avoid overfitting slash underfitting? Right. So uh, for a random forest to avoid overfitting, the main thing you need to do is to optimize. Uh, the tuning parameter that governs the number of features that are randomly chosen to grow each tree from the bootstrap data. Typically, uh, you do this via a k-fold cross-validation, and uh, you choose uh, the tuning parameter that minimizes the test sample prediction error. OK, question 40. Is there a random forest routine implemented in SNAP? Um, yeah, so I uh, we have mentioned this already. Yes, there is. Uh, but as I've mentioned, it has a number of limitations, or at least from my point of view, it has limitations. But uh, you can test it, and perhaps it will uh, fit your needs well. Um, it has a little bit different needs for the input data uh, or the training data, as I've already mentioned, and so on. And question 41, what is your advice for crop classification? pixel or object-based classification? Um, both have advantages. Um, I believe the object-based classification in some areas will give you uh, very nice clean results, uh, but it is more difficult to be implemented and there are study areas for it, which it's uh, just simply not suitable. Um, so, and it will depend of course on how good your segmentation is going to be and the segmentation can be really uh, problematic so uh, pixel classification is generally simple simpler let's say question 42 for splitting training and validation data should we choose different polygon slash regions or is it okay to sample over the same polygons mm -hmm. so i would recommend if possible to choose different polygons uh, because this will uh, really uh, ensure that your training and validation data are independent. If you use the same uh, polygons, it may be that, for example, um, your uh, your polygon is uh, either erogenously uh, classified in your in your or in your um, training data or in your original data that you use. Um, and if that's not that's not the case, for example, if you're using um, field data, then still I think it's better to have independent, uh, independent, completely independent samples. Wonderful question forty three. What is the required machine configuration for running this code? Can it be done in Google Colab? Uh, yes. So I am not familiar with Google Colab. Um, Generally, if you have a uh, possibility to install uh, all the required packages, um, you should also have the possibility to insta install Snap because we are using Snappy. But I, in the code I'm explaining this, it can be overcome. So you can simply just extract the list of bands. And that is basically the only thing that we use Snappy for. Um, there should be no problem, uh, no reason why you shouldn't be able to uh, run it in any environment you choose. And question 44, why is it important to have the coordinates uh, UTM East and UTM North in the attributes table? Um, so this is just the way I built my, my extraction of the training, training data. Uh, or now let's not think about training data, the shape files, but the training data that we extracted in the code. So when we are sampling, when we are using the training data to extract also all the values of all the features or bands. Uh, for the specific training and validation data points. And uh, the way I've implemented it is that it uses a, a list of coordinates. Um, so that's why I need to have the, the coordinates there. And question 45, can we stack images of several years and then run the classification? If so, what will the effect on accuracy be then? Well, the question here is, where is when is your training data from then? because the crops will generally change between years. So it actually may be so here, I say that it, the accuracy might be very low because they will change between years, um, but maybe it would not be low. I never tested this, maybe it would be high, but it would really correspond only to that year from which you have your training data. 
And I even think it would further degrade because in the future years, not all the fields would change in the same way. So uh, in general, you always, always need to run a new class new training of the classifier and new classification for the for the further uh, for the next years and you need to have new training data that is unfortunately the way it is well Teresa thank you so much for helping we are at the the, the hour I guess the, the half hour which is the end of mm -hmm. this fourth part of this five part webinar series we want to thank everybody for for all the participants for joining today and for and for sticking this out to the end of the Q and A session. Uh, there were a number of questions that we did not address, uh, but they will be. Uh, we will follow up. We'll get all of the answers on the doc and we'll post it on the RSET website uh, by next week, hopefully by next Tuesday, which is when the uh, the fifth and final part of this webinar series will be held. So we do hope everybody will will come back on Tuesday uh, for the conclusion of this wonderful webinar series. I would like to acknowledge the wonderful guest presenters we've had today, uh, Teresa, Teresa Roth. Uh, also, big thanks for, for helping out with the Q&A doc. Uh, wonderful, wonderful job. Also, a very, very big thanks to Dr. Laura Dingle-Robertson. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation today. Uh, and also to the entire team that behind the scenes that was helping out, uh, Brock Levins, Amita Mekta, Erica Podist, uh, Selwyn hudson Odoi, Jonathan O'Brien, uh, and then all of our colleagues from, from ESA and, and, and uh, Agri Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Uh, thank you everybody for joining today, and we hope to see you next Tuesday for the conclusion of this webinar series. So thank you and stay safe.